Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. What a 24 hours. Whipsawed by surprise rate hikes and soft economic data this morning stateside. Equity futures right now just about positive. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York coming up, global bond market shaken by surprise rate hikes. Drucker Miller, Dalio, warning the pain is coming as jobless claims surge to new highs for the year. We begin with the big issue. Blame Canada for the smog and for the bond market volatility too. A second surprise rate hike this week, first Australia, then Canada's central bank following with an increase of its own, stating that monetary policy was not sufficiently restrictive to bring supply and demand into balance. The latest move coming after Canada signaled a conditional pause back in January. Sound familiar? Jim Reader Deutsche Bank says the big question now is whether the Fed might follow up with a hike of their own next Wednesday or whether they'll finally keep rates on hold after 10 consecutive increases. The move this week running counter to the widely held view that central banks are just about done. City's economists who correctly called for a rate hike yesterday are predicting for more of the same next week. Andrew Hollenhorst saying the surprise nature of hikes shows that once it becomes clear policy rates are not sufficiently restrictive, our base case remains for a 20 25 basis point rate hike next week from the Fed. The Fed's next meeting just six days away. Joining us now to discuss Morgan Stanley, Seth Carpenter, Colin Martin, and Charles Schwab. Gents, it's Blame Canada Day. Indulge me. Seth, we won't talk about the smog, we'll talk about the rate hikes. Based on the information we've had this morning, claims a whole lot softer surging into next week. Is the base case for you and the team no change? So the base case still is uh, no change. And just to uh, defend Canada a little bit, my mother grew up in Nova Scotia, so I feel <laughs> a little bit of uh, responsibility there. Um, no, the base case is still no change, but I, I hasten to add it is data dependent. So we have a forecast for the CPI release coming out on Tuesday uh, to be three, three, three tenths on core CPI continued progress on the key components of inflation that the Fed cares about. And if we get that, then I think we're still very comfortable with our call for there being uh, no hike next week. But as always, it's data dependent. And I think everyone should have realized when the Bank of Canada said it's a conditional pause. What is it conditional on? It's conditional on how the data evolve over time. Colin, what's your call? Uh, I, I agree with Seth. I think the key point with Canada is, is that conditional pause. They hiked. They told us that they're going to wait and see what happens. And then we heard from them yesterday that they, that they thought that policy wasn't restricted enough to slow things down. I think that's the same approach the Fed is going to take. They're not going to change their plans next week based on what other central banks are doing. They're going to look at the data that's coming in. We did get somewhat of a softer reading today, although that's just one data point. So we're going to need to see a few more uh, prints like that before we get proof that there is more of a slowdown coming. Um, but I think it does come down to the inflation outlook. Disinflation came a little bit and it's kind of stalled and the Fed wants to see how that progresses. So we don't expect a hike next week. We actually think the odds of a hike in July are a bit lower than what the markets are expecting. But at the end of the day, the door is open and this is giving them time to really evaluate how their policy is rippling through the markets and what it means going forward. Colin, let's talk about that statement from Governor Tiff Macklin, that line that monetary policy was not sufficiently restrictive. People are starting to imagine that maybe that line might be in the Fed's future. Is it more likely than not that if they pause, take a skip at the next meeting, they'll be hiking again later this summer? It's certainly possible. I mean, we've heard that. We know Bullard's talked about that, where he acknowledged that we just got to a level that's restrictive, where other Fed officials are kind of in, in various camps. But it does remain to be seen how restrictive policy is right now. Yes, in an absolute term, uh, yeah, Fed funds rate over 5%. It's the highest we've seen in a long time. Uh, we think it should be restrictive. But if we look at what's happening with the economy, especially with a lot of the hard data, plenty of surveys are telling us that things should slow down. But when we look at consumption trends and spending trends, and then especially with the labor market, which may be starting to loosen but is still admittedly tight, maybe it's not restrictive enough. So I think that's going to be a key point. Uh, but we're still in the camp that there is a lag with all of these rate hikes. And over time, 
all of those survey-based sentiment measures that we're looking at, we do think that that should ultimately lead to slightly slower economic growth and then a downward trend in that, in that disinflation. Seth, I remember a note you put out post-SVB failure, I think it was in late March, about the difficulty of calibrating policy appropriately for the situation we're in, particularly after the stress we'd seen in a financial system. Has that got easier? Got harder. No, I don't. Which one? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's got any easier at all. Uh, I, um, we may have to have different people on the show because Colin and I are very much in alignment at this point. Uh, it remains to be seen. There are lags of policy. I think everything that happened with the banking sector uh, reveals uh, the need for the Fed to assess over time just how much restraint is being imparted on the economy. Our forecast is that not only are they not hiking next week, they're also not going to hike in July. But I will go back one more time to say it is a conditional forecast, conditional on us getting the data forecast right with inflation continuing to trend down and uh, a bit more softening in the labor market. Seth, do they have the luxury of being wrong? The reason I ask that is if they are wrong and it takes longer for this to get back towards target, do you think there's a window here of risk that it becomes more embedded? Do you have a window where you have to deal with this? before that risk materializes? I mean, I think the, the fact everyone has to accept is that uh, everyone is going to be wrong, including the Fed. The question is how much and in which direction. Uh, in the context of whether or not inflation expectations, for example, will become unanchored, whether this inflationary process becomes embedded, uh, I personally don't think so. At least there's no evidence of that yet. If we look at survey measures, if we look at break-evens, it does look as if in the longer run inflation expectations are still under control. I don't think they, by any stretch of the imagination, want to take that fact for granted. Um, but, you know, again, as Colin said, we've got the funds rate up over 500 basis points from where we started. The balance sheet is still running off. Uh, it is hard to imagine that anyone would conclude that the Fed has just thrown in the towel on inflation at this point. Hard to get a read on the economic data at the moment, Seth. Jobless claims were lower. There were distortions associated with the data coming out of certain states, and now they're higher again, and we're wondering whether there are distortions associated with certain states all over again. Seth, how would you read that surge in claims this morning? Uh, I would read it as uh, one week worth of data that goes in the direction of, of being softer, but by no means would I change my overall view on the economy based on that one data point. Uh, it's just too noisy. Put it together with the jobs report on Friday, Colin. What kind of state is this labor market in? You know, it still seems pretty tight right now. Uh, I'll, I'll joke and, and go to a point, Seth, me. You probably booked the wrong people here. We're in total agreement right now. I'll start uh, disagreeing with you, Bob. Number this morning. <laughs> <laughs> the jobless claims number this morning is, is just one claim. But, but we would expect it to start trickling higher. That's been the kind of the, the mismatch we've seen that has admittedly been longer than we've expected. We've seen all these headlines that started with tech companies, also then kind of trickled into to the financial sector of layoffs. And then we weren't seeing it in the initial jobless claims data, nor were we seeing it in the payrolls data. Maybe we start to see that trickle in as these lags come through and as time passes. At the end of the day, the labor market does appear to be relatively strong. We did get that jump in the unemployment rate uh, at, at the previous uh, jobs report release. But I think that's going to be important to watch as we look at the next month or even two. Luckily, we'll get one more before the next Fed meeting to see what that household survey did, what do non-farm payrolls look like, and does the unemployment rate continue to rise? Because if I think it does continue to rise, even if it's by a tenth or so, that supports the case for the, pet, the Fed to pause and really see what's going to happen over the next handful of quarters. Seth, I've had a lot of questions, people running in, about the labor market report from last Friday. The establishment survey, which goes into payrolls, the household survey, which goes into the unemployment rate. Seth, how were you explaining that to clients? Uh, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. It went against our forecast. And so what I never want to do is, is sort of cherry pick only the parts that go in the direction of, of our forecast. I mean, it's just a, an empirical fact that the household survey tends to be more noisy than the payroll, than the establishment survey. And so I think you have to uh, admit that there's some strength there. Nevertheless, uh, what we have no, what we what we know as a fact over the past year or so is that the amount of payrolls in the economy 
relative to the amount of GDP, the, the amount of economic activity, the economy is still shorthanded. So part of the strength in the hiring, part of the strength in last week's uh, jobs report, I think reflects the fact that businesses know they're still shorthanded and they're they're making up a little bit for lost time. So I think you want you can discount just a little bit that strength, but boy, uh, it, it was an upside surprise. Seth, it's so confusing for so many people. I'd like to fold in as well what's happening with housing too. I'll read into the equity market and you can give me the economics perspective to this as well. The home builders on the S&P 500 are up by close to 80% from the lows of almost 12 months ago in the middle of June last year. Seth, that's maybe going against the grain a little bit in the equity market. Seth, can you explain that, the economics of that? What is going on with housing with rates of 5% and mortgage rates potentially through 7%? One of the points I do like to make to clients all the time is that the equity market is not the economy, at least especially not sort of at any point in time. And so what did we see in actual economic activity in the housing market? Housing starts fell and they fell like a stone. They have stopped falling, right? Uh, they maybe have turned up a little bit, but in levels terms, they're still quite low. Now, the equity market saw all of that coming. We saw a rise in interest rates. We know from history that that kind of rise in interest rates is going to lead to a drop in economic activity. So the market got ahead of all of that, priced things down for home builders a year ago. And now that we've seen presumably the bottom, markets are starting to look forward through time and saying, okay, we still know that uh, for instance, people who have 30-year mortgages, they're locked in, they're not gonna be selling their home. So a larger proportion than normal of any home sales are gonna come from new homes because people who are living in their homes aren't gonna sell unless they have to. And I think that's part of what squares that seeming tension between the still weak levels of, of housing starts against what we're seeing for home builder stocks. Seth Collin, in agreement, you're gonna be sticking with us. Coming off of the program a little bit later, we'll continue this conversation. Let's just get into the market just a little bit. We're just about negative on the S&P 500 at the moment with some movers. Here's Abby. John, we'll be taking a look at two of the stocks that are dragging on indexes. But first, let's start off with a winner. That is Adobe. Shares are popping, although maybe not quite as much as you would expect, given the fact that AI is a part of the headline. They're launching subscriptions for new generative AI features that will include copyright protection. The stock up 1.7%. Signet Jewelers down 10.4%, well off its lows, but nonetheless, they slashed their annual Outlook, the fiscal 2024 is now between 7.1 billion and 7.3 billion in sales. They're seeing fewer engagements and they're also seeing couples choose cheaper engagement rings. GameStop plunging down 23%. Matt Furlong is out. Ryan Cohen is in as CEO. They missed sales by more than 7%. A narrower loss and Cohen, of course, Ryan Cohen owns 12%. It's going to be interesting to see how this company has potentially changed. Abby, thank you. More on some of that around the open and bow. Coming up, legendary investors weighing in on that elusive recession. Since it's taken so long, the Fed has ended up with a higher terminal rate. And in fact, inflation gets stickier the long it stays in the system, that it increases, not decreases, the probability of a hard landing. Right now, building on that, Shanani Bassett catching up with John Waldron of Goldman Sachs, saying that this recession is the best predicted recession that hasn't happened yet and may not happen. That conversation still ahead. Does the fact that it hasn't started yet change the probability of whether it's going to be hard or soft? I would actually argue, since it's taken so long, the Fed has ended up with a higher terminal rate. And in fact, inflation gets stickier the longer it stays in the system, that it increases, not decreases, the probability of a hard landing. Famed investor Stanley Druckenmiller remaining pessimistic on the U.S. economy. Ray Dalio delivering a warning of his own. We are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. Seth Carpenter, Colin Martin back with us. Colin, you get to go first on this one. That warning from Ray Dalio there on the debt market, you're in fixed income. What do you think when you hear that? Well, that's that was a pretty dire warning, but but 
we think that that the debt market is is still in pretty good shape. And if we look at where yields are right now, we still think it's an opportunity. So I don't have the full context of his comments there, but when we're talking to clients, that's not the message we're relaying. Although admittedly, we do get that sometimes because when you hear snippets like that, we hear clients concerned about a debt bubble or something like that. At the end of the day, we're not concerned about that. Uh, what we focus on is, well, one, the safety of the treasury market, but then also the yields they offer. This is something that's been talked about I mean, every day on all these programs for the past number of months, the attractive yields that are out there. What we're finding is that our clients are still generally sitting in very short-term investments, and it's hard to blame them because treasury yields of 5% or more are attractive. They're at the highest levels we've seen in years, but we're still trying to get them to get their feet wet a little bit with some more intermediate or long-term bonds where you're taking out some of that reinvestment risk should the Fed have to cut rates down the road and some of the uncertainty. And it's, it's a tough message uh, to get out there, and it's a tough pill to swallow when you see such attractive short-term rates, uh, but we're continuing to, to provide that guidance and suggest suggest our investors move out a little bit and lock in yields of three and a half, four percent or more uh, with very high quality investments with slightly longer maturities. Colin, Tom and I are calling that a cash trap, that once you get in, it's much harder to get back out. Do you see some reinvestment risk on the horizon then? People that have gone into T-bills now, that when they come out the other side, those yields won't be available anymore? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the huge risk that, that we're talking about. But it does seem like that risk might be pushed back a little bit. I mean, we're not in the camp that the Fed necessarily is going to cut rates anytime soon. We still disagree with the, the pricing we see in the market where the Fed funds futures is implying a rate hike by July and then a rate cut just a few months later. We don't really subscribe to that theory where we think the Fed can hold and pause for a long time. But at the end of the day, we do expect a rate cut uh, to come um, because the Fed will likely need to because of the negative consequences of the restrictive policy that we that we see right now. And we don't want our investors or any investors uh, to be caught wrong footed like that and be tempted with a 5% yield now only to see four, three and a half, three percent at some point down the road when you can lock in higher yields with certainty. So that's been our main message. It continues yep. to be our message. It does seem like maybe reinvestment risk has been pushed back a little bit but it's still very much present. Seth, finally, we call it here the three-month rolling recession forecast. We just kind of keep pushing it out a couple of months. <laughs> Every single month It's three months away. Seth, any reason to believe it comes anytime soon? And where are you and the team now for that first cut? Yeah, so for the first cut, from our perspective, that's not until uh, March of next year, March of 2024. Uh, we don't have a recession in our forecast as a baseline uh, scenario. Slowing growth this year for sure. And in fact, if the economy is proving to be more resilient than people think, then the Fed's just going to have to do more in order to, to slow things down to get inflation down over time. But, but we're, we're, we're reasonably comfortable with our forecast now. We think that we'll, we'll get further slowing, but not a recession uh, this year, not a recession next year. Seth Carpenter, Colin Martin to the two of you. Even though you agreed, I enjoyed it. It's great to get your perspective from the both of you on what's happening right now. Is it a recession that we can avoid? Right now happening at the Bloomberg Invest Conference, Goldman Sachs' president, COO, John Waldron sitting down with Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. On that very topic, John Waldron a little bit earlier so in the conversation saying this might be a recession that we can avoid altogether. Let's listen in. Value what we're doing, but I, I would say a couple of things. First, we have two very big, very scaled businesses that we feel great about. One, global banking and markets which is a $30 billion plus minus revenue business that generates mid-teens returns that is a leading client franchise all over the world in banking type activities and in market type activities. And we've increasingly run that business in an integrated fashion, particularly focused on financing our clients, where we think there's an enormous opportunity. We, we talked about the environment. One of the things I didn't say that I probably should have said, and we feel strongly, the financing environment in the, in the economy is going to get tougher. It's going to be a higher cost to finance. It's going to be less available than it was. Financing was quite plentiful. It's going to get more complicated. Goldman Sachs is very well positioned to be a more prominent financier for our clients. And by running the global banking and markets businesses now in an integrated fashion, we think we're bringing all that intellectual capital and throw away together to be more valuable to our clients. So we love that business. We think that business is going to continue to produce mid-teens returns through the cycle. And there's obviously growth and opportunity for us to continue to take share. We've proven we can take share. The second primary scale business in the firm, as you said, is called Asset and Wealth Management. That is a business that is, is an aggregation of a bunch of businesses that we had inside the firm that we've now brought together into an integrated platform. It's really three primary components. There's a liquid active asset manager, 
with $2.7 trillion of assets under supervision on that platform, top five active asset manager in the world, very global, runs the gamut from a product solution standpoint, from cash and money markets through fixed income, fundamental equity, quant, and all the way through to the riskier end of the spectrum. So it's a fully integrated, fully scaled platform. We have a top five alternatives asset manager with $450 billion or so of alternatives assets, which also is a hugely fully scaled platform, very global. Uh, and then we have a wealth management business, which focuses primarily on the ultra high net worth segment, which are the wealthiest individuals and families in the world. That business has a trillion dollars of client assets on the platform. Uh, it focuses on, as I said, the wealthier families, but we're only an 8% share in the Americas, if you take the Americas broadly as a, as a category. So there's a lot of fragmentation in that marketplace. We've been at that a long time. We continue to grow that business mid to high single digits, and we think there's an enormous amount of runway there. We also think there's a lot of runway internationally in Europe and Asia as we continue to build our platform globally. So those three businesses now run on one integrated platform. We're spending a lot of time in terms of tech transformation to build a more unified chassis, as I would call it, that underpins uh, those three businesses. So we have, we have a scaled institutional client base. We have a scaled wealth management client base. We have public market capability. We have private market capability. And we have an integrated platform that is increasingly tech forward and much more digital and much more scalable. And so that, that business for us is under transformation. We have historically pursued the alternatives business with more of our own capital in a more merchant banking oriented fashion. So Goldman Sachs, unlike a Blackstone or a KKR, would have had a lot more of our own balance sheet invested in our alternatives assets. We have, over the last four years, transitioned that balance sheet from 60 plus billion dollars of historical principal investments on the balance sheet to less than $30 billion on the balance sheet. And we've stated a goal to get it down below $15 billion by the end of 2024 and to zero in the intermediate term. And we'll end up with $20 billion or so of co-investment in our funds. So every dollar we have on the platform from our balance sheet will be aligned 100% co-invested in the funds with our clients. That is a very unique scaled platform that we have to make work and we have to prove the synergy in the context of that business. But that is also a business that we think can be a mid-teens business through the cycle. So Goldman Sachs, in a handful of years, is going to have a mid-teens global banking and markets business and a mid-teens asset and wealth management business at scale with a lot of growth opportunity where we're going to be more management fee intensive than we have been, much less balance sheet, much more balance sheet light, with an enormous amount of opportunity to grow, a great brand, a globally scaled business, and, and a lot of talent. And so that is the story of Goldman Sachs, and we've got to now go execute on that. What does this mean? Because you just kind of highlighted one part of Goldman Sachs looks a lot like KKR and Apollo, just one part, right? And so how big does that alternative asset manager get within Goldman Sachs? And how does it fit with the other businesses, for example, with investment banking, with those folks being some of your biggest clients? It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I have watched the growth of alternative assets with um, you know, with awe, frankly, and over the, I've been, I've spent a lot of my career in and around alternative assets. I was doing private equity deals for those companies and other clients of the firm, you know, 20 some years ago. The, the scale of these firms is extraordinary and they continue to grow and take share, if you will, of the, of the asset aggregation in the world. And I don't see why that will change. I think that will continue. The growth rate might moderate a little bit. It's a little tougher for fundraising environment today than it would have been a handful of years ago. But I think more clients want access to the, the aggregate return and the alpha opportunity in private assets. And private assets obviously runs the gamut from private equity to credit to infrastructure growth, et cetera. And so we, Goldman Sachs for 30 years has been a leader in this business. We have just done it a little differently than, than would be the traditional private equity firms that have done it mostly with third party funds. We've done it with our own, our own capital. As I said, we're transitioning that. But we've got a few unique attributes. As you said, we have the largest investment bank and I think the leading investment bank in the world. That provides an enormous sourcing engine. We're sourcing transactions and ideas and introductions to CEOs and so forth for our clients and for our own team. And we're doing, I think, a very good job partnering with our clients. So the firms you mentioned and other firms, I could run off a litany of transactions where we partnered with them or we have an idea, we bring it to them and say, why don't you guys invest with us and we'll prosecute the idea together. So we found a symbiotic relationship in the context of, of running this strategy. Our business with those firms, I think, has gotten better as we pursued the strategy. But it takes, it takes a, a focus on partnering 
doing what's right for our clients, and we can benefit along the, along the way in that context, but it's got to come from the clients first. Let's talk about talent for a moment here, because with James Gorman and Morgan Stanley saying he'll step down in a year, there's been a lot of focus on succession at Wall Street. David Solomon has been in the position for five years now. Uh, the question here, and, and frankly, you're the most clear successor. And so how long is David's tenure expected to be? And how are you thinking about building the bench even deeper at Goldman, especially with such high profile turnover, not just at Goldman, but in all of Wall Street? Well, I'd say the following. CEO succession is not something I spend a lot of time on. I have a lot to do. I just outlined all the things we have, we ha we, we, <laughs> we have to do. We, we, I, my job is to execute with our team, execute that strategy. So, so my days are full executing that strategy. We do spend a lot of time on succession below, let's say, the, the CEO or president or CFO level. I spend a lot of time running succession processes for our, for our people below that level. And I think we've done a, a better job in the last four or five years really trying to build a deeper succession pipeline and giving our talent, which I think is extraordinary, more opportunities to grow and develop, to move around, to get new job opportunities, new stretch assignments, and to continue to position them to be able to ascend to the kind of jobs that, that David and I sit in. And we have an extraordinary bench, but our job is to not just look at the bench and say, wow, it's really great. Our job is to work on that bench and that talent and that strength and do the right things to develop them. So that's, that's what occupies my time and attention as, as it relates to succession. Uh, earlier in the conversation, you kind of talked about the potential for investment in AI and technology. Goldman was really at the forefront of really automating a lot of businesses. I remember Lloyd Blankbein once speaking at a conference about automating equities to the point of bringing a 500 trading 500 person trading desk to one. Uh, are you working on using AI to further automate some of the more difficult areas like fixed income trading or investment banking? So we've been using AI for a while. And as you, as you, as you rightly point out to Lloyd's comments, our firm I think has been very forward leaning on technology for a long time. And there's been lots of different developments and innovations that we've tried to you know, be adaptive to. And I think we're generally speaking a leader in technology. We're not the only one, but we generally try to be pretty front footed. And I think it's been very important for Goldman Sachs to continually find ways to use technology to advance our ability to serve our clients and also to make our firm more efficient. And generative AI, when I think, you know, you say AI, we've been using AI. The new, the real new development here are these large language models, the power and strength of these large language models and what they can do. And so when we think about generative AI, we really start, first of all, with let's build a governance standard and, and capability inside the firm so that when we do things with respect to generative AI, they're done in a way that we're very, very comfortable with because I think governance is going to be critical. And then the second thing is to develop use cases that are valuable, interesting use cases for us to start to explore how we can use the generative AI to, to suit an objective. And I would put the use cases in two buckets. One is more efficiency, automation, process re-engineering inside the firm to make us more efficient, to do things that are very human-centric, um, to take things that are very human-centric and make them more automated and use some of the capability and power of the computing to, to simplify and, and make the processes more durable, more resilient, and better. The second bucket is really how can we serve our clients better and develop intellectual content and, and judgment on top of that intellectual content that can be more powerful and more valuable. And so we're looking at both. And we're starting to really test in a very safe, governed way uh, some of these use cases and developing uh, our strategy forward. It's very early. John Waldron there we're of Goldman Sachs in conversation with Shanali Basak on AI, on all things banking, on recession, a little bit earlier in the conversation, saying maybe we avoid that recession altogether. From New York City this morning, good morning. If you are just tuning into the program, seconds away from the opening bell with equity futures on the S&P 500, just about unchanged. There is your opening bell on the Nasdaq yesterday, biggest one-day drop going back to April. Struggling to bounce here. Get into the bond market. This bond market whipsawed. Absolutely whipsawed in the last 24 hours. Yesterday, yields were higher. Off the back of a conversation about higher interest rates in Australia and then Canada. This morning, yields are lower. At the front end by four or five basis points on a 10-year by two. Off the back of some pretty dreadful economic data about one hour ago. Jobless claims surging to new highs for 2023. We'll see if that data is distorted or not. That's just one week. We'll wait for another one. In another one, and we'll see if this Fed takes a conditional pause, skips a hike at their next meeting about six days away. Into the FX market, off the back of that data, too, we show some dollar weakness here, some euro strength, 107.50 on the euro, positive on that currency pair by about 0.5%, and crude around about 0.36% higher, up by about 25 cents this morning to $72.00. 
and 80 cents. Let's get to one stock on a move. Carvana in a big way. Shares getting a boost as the company says its quart Q2 EBITDA is expected to top $50 million. The CEO saying this, the first quarter was a big step in the right direction. It is clear our strategy is working as evidenced by our 61% increase in gross profit per unit. The best Q1 figure in company history. Abby, that stock absolutely surging. It is absolutely surging. But what's interesting here, John, there's so much volatility for the shares of Carvana that since the beginning of May, we have now seen, including today, this is the eighth move that's greater than 10%. And if it can get back above 20%, there it is. It's the fourth time we've seen this stock uh, climb by 20% on a trading day. So again, lots of volatility here. A piece of that is the fact that the stock is down 95% from its all-time peak. And there's a 50% short interest. So lots of lots of volatility. But for today's move, it is definitely fundamentally driven in terms of those results that you were just talking about. Better than expected. The used car retailer uh, really putting up a, a, a net income uh, that's stronger. They didn't give guidance for the net income, but their estimate for adjusted earnings of $50 million in the, the this current quarter uh, versus the estimate of $3.6 million of a loss. That's really a significant difference. Investors rewarding those shares at this point. Again, uh, the stock is absolutely uh, soaring right around that 20% up mark. Amazing. Up 19% right now. Abby, thank you. Different story for GameStop. Shares extending its double-digit loss amid major C-suite changes. The retailer firing its CEO, Matt Furlong, and electing a new executive chairman. This coming on top of a weaker than expected Q1. Isabel Lee has more. Hey, Isabel. Hi, John. It's definitely a one-two punch for GameStop. Shares were plunging as much as 22% in pre-market trading, and it's now lower by around 19%. And as you said, yes, the company reported net sales that missed estimates. And more importantly, it terminated Matt Furlong, its president and CEO of two years. The company announced that Ryan Cohen will serve as executive chairman effective immediately. And Cohen is the largest shareholder of the company with 12% of the stock. General counsel Matt Robinson will become general manager and principal executive officer. He will report Report to Cohen. So here's the interesting, interesting thing, John. GameStop called off its earnings, and Wall Street strategists aren't happy. We have Jeffrey's analysts saying it's difficult to have an opinion on results without a call. They also said the only thing consistent is management change. Barrett also said the firm's turnaround plan seems similar to what it was before the NFT craze. So definitely lots of changes in GameStop. Isabel, thank you. Canfana up almost 20%. GameStop there down almost 20 percent. Turning to tech, Lucid gearing up to enter the Chinese EV market. According to Reuters, the company is also said to be considering local production in the country. Their stock slightly higher by 3 percent. Ed Rudlow has more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Reuters uh, referencing uh, Lucid's China head, Zhu Zhang, in those comments that they intend to enter the Chinese market uh, on an export basis. Vehicles built in uh, Casa Grande, Arizona, that would then be uh, imports into the Chinese market. They cite an unnamed person familiar with the matter on the idea that Lucid is looking at local production. As you and I have discussed many times, there are many more players in the Chinese EV market and a much broader spectrum of product offering from the very high end in which Lucid operates to much cheaper mass market models. I've been covering this company for years, and I remember all the way back in 2018-19, Peter Rawlinson, the CEO, talking about this idea, this distant idea of China uh, being an opportunity. But at that time, they had no concrete plans. We've reached out to Lucid for comments. They have not yet replied to confirm that that is their intention. Uh, the, the, it adds to recent news that they did a $3 billion offering, most of which will come from the Saudi Public Investment Fund, which already hold 60% of the company. And the narrative around Lucid is really, are we moving towards privatization? They have had so many production problems, uh, never really got off the ground in terms of volume production and have cut their full year guidance a number of times over the last fiscal year or so. Um, because that high price point is one that everyone was watching with excitement. But again, they've struggled to really get to that scale production that, that others like Rivian, for example, have managed to do. Ed, let's park that, put that to one side, and let's unpack the story you and I actually want to talk about. Oh, what do sure. you make of that Lionel Messi deal? The potential that yeah. there could be a profit share in agreement with Apple? I have been thinking about the MLS for some time, and you know, some valleys coming up, the Allen and Co conference. A year ago, one of the big stories was the tie up between MLS and Apple TV. And you look at some of the reporting out there, the profit sharing mechanism which Apple TV is involved in. Is this liftoff now, a name like Lionel Messi? You know, Gareth Bale, for example, didn't have that amplifying effect when he was at LAFC. Lionel Messi is probably a different category, right? But I think about the streaming rights 
Apple TV made a big move to bring MLS to the international audience, not just the US audience. I wonder how many eyeballs it brings in, John, Amazing. You know, from a streaming perspective. You know that I want this league to get off the ground. I'm desperate for some, some real action, uh, uh, but I think it's going to be needle moving. Uh, more to life than money, football is life. I agree. Ed Lado, thank you for that. That's why I wanted to go there. I'm looking forward to your coverage a little bit later on Bloomberg Technology. Karen and Hyde, Ed Ludlow, coming up in about two hours and 25 minutes' time. Let's stick with tech. Adobe jumping on the AI bandwagon with a plan to offer subscription services. Katie Greifert has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Let's talk about what we're actually talking about for these subscriptions. So these are subscriptions for tools that will generate images from a prompt across Adobe products, including Photoshop, of course, one of their most popular products. And in addition, if a customer is sued for infringement, Adobe will pay damages and help in court. Now, this move got a lot of love from the sell side this morning. You had both Piper Sandler and Deutsche Bank raising their price targets on Adobe to $500. For context, currently we're around $432, give or take. So with Piper Sandler's Brent Braceland, he specifically cited the company's, quote, accelerating pace of innovation that's evident by these new Gen AI features. Now, of the 41 analysts that come track this company, there's zero sell ratings. And you can see it's getting a lot of love from shareholders this morning, currently up about 3%. This company reports next week. It's going to be interesting to see how much of a hot topic AI is, AI is on that Adobe call. Katie, thank you. That's the latest right now on Adobe. You've heard the warnings about narrow leadership. A lot of the levers that drove mega cap tech to its, you know, soaring weights in the S&P 500 have at least stalled, if not reversed. It's going to be a very stock specific uh, leadership cycle. So I think some big cap will do well, but others won't. I would be worried about mega cap tech and a lot of the, you know, the sort of uh, low interest rate beneficiary leadership in the market. That's equities. What about credit? Amanda Lynham and the team over at BlackRock saying this. It's not all about technology and credit. While the sector has been a meaningful contributor in both investment grade and high yield, it pales in comparison to the equity market. Amanda Lynham joins us now for more. Amanda, always wonderful to catch up with you. Let's start there. The story that we see, narrow leadership in equity markets, do you see the same thing in credit? Good morning, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Uh, we don't see the same thing in the credit market, and that cuts across both ratings cohorts and regions. Um, and as you alluded to in, in your previous segment, you were talking about how the equity market is not the economy. This is a great example of how the equity market is also not the credit market in many respects. We've had more broad-based participation from sectors in terms of contributing to total performance or that breath measure that we think is really important for capturing alpha. We've had more broad-based participation at the sector level in the credit market year to date versus for sure what you've seen in the S&P 500 compared to the equal weighted index in the equity market. I think that continues. And, and one of the really interesting things that we've seen is that it's, it's somewhat easy to say, well, Perhaps the total return contribution tracks the index weight in the credit market. We've seen sectors that were punching above their weight in the credit market, like energy, like leisure and lodging, like retail in the high yield market in particular, um, that have really outperformed relative to what their index weight would suggest in terms of contributing to total return performance. And in this environment where dispersion is high, where we do expect an uptick in defaults as the cycle continues, um, we're expecting below trend growth, as you know, sticky inflation. We do not expect rate cuts. We expect a higher cost of capital environment. We think that that dispersion will continue to drive alpha generation. But we, we hold on to this point that breadth is really important for total return contributions and credit. And we think that that pattern will continue, unlike uh, perhaps what we've seen year to date in the equity market. Amanda, I want to talk about return potential and credit just a little bit more because you're not the first person. You won't be the last. I've heard from a lot of people this week from fixed income through cold water of what's been developing in equities. Mark Kiesel of PIMCO said this earlier this week to me. He said, we haven't seen this return potential in bonds in more than a decade. We don't think this yields will be there in a year from now. Amanda, just what is this setup like from your perspective? Can you describe it? For sure. So I think, you know, walking into this year, we did have a, and we still do have a really attractive opportunity across various subsets of fixed income. All in yields are at levels that we haven't seen in some cases over a decade. Again, 
you know, the credit market is very nuanced, so it depends on what region and, and asset class you're looking at. Um, but the point that we've made recently is that a lot of that heavy lifting in terms of getting yields, all in yields up to those very attractive levels has been done by the risk-free rate. And in some areas, spreads are, are actually still quite snug. You know, the U.S. high yield market in particular is below the median of the post-financial crisis era and the past two decades. And so we think that it's reasonable to expect a rebuild of risk premia in some of these markets, so meaning spreads would go wider. Um, and so that's something that, that we're definitely watching for. But to your point, it, it's a very attractive uh, opportunity set in fixed income for especially all in yield buyers. Um, and we think that that probably persists because, again, I think the bar for the Fed and, and other central banks, frankly, to cut rates is, is quite high, and we continue to have that view. And we're seeing it from central banks around the world, really, just because inflation is, is so persistently elevated. And I think it will take time for that to come down. The other point that I, I think we've been talking a lot with investors about has been how to diversify portfolios in the environment that we do have this higher for longer interest rate environment. And we're firmly in that camp. And we've been looking to alternative assets, specifically private debt, as a really good way for investors to, you know, capture some of that floating rate exposure, even though we may be you know, very much towards the end of the rate hiking cycle, but still build in some of those structural protections that we think will be really important as we head towards a period of below trend growth, sticky inflation, restrictive monetary policy. So a really challenging growth inflation and policy mix with a higher cost of capital for an extended period of time added to that. Amanda, is that below trend real? GDP and will nominal GDP continue to be quite high like it has been over the last couple of years and with that in mind how do you think about what that means for the performance of credit because if I speak to equity investors living in a nominal world they like the idea that nominal GDP will stay high can I get your comments yeah, on that and what that means for credit for sure yeah it's a great point so I think the inflationary backdrop has boosted nominal earnings but same time, you're also having inflationary pressures on the cost of goods sold, the cost of capital. And so that's something that in investors are, are very mindful of. And on the corporate side, um, whether you're managing to your, your equity stakeholders or your credit stakeholders, you really do need to manage that kind of nominal growth in the costs that are eating through your margins. And what we've seen is that even the higher quality aspects of credit. So to your point on how that flows through, the higher quality rating buckets in the credit market haven't been immune to those pressures on margins. In fact, for various points of this year, whether you cut it by spreads or excess returns or total returns, the high end of the high yield market in some instances has been outperforming the low end of the IG market. And so it really just speaks to the point that your top line can get a boost from inflation, but at the end of the day, it's the bottom line profit that really matters. And that those inflationary pressures, specifically wages, but, but other parts of the, the expense uh, line items as well, are, are really inflated because of that inflationary environment. And that's something that corporates are going to need to handle for an extended period of time. We're seeing it in the cost of capital, but then we're also seeing it in the regular way earnings. And, and I think it's been striking that the higher quality markets, uh, parts of the market haven't been immune to that. Interesting. Amanda, thank you. As always, great note, by the way. Really interesting read. Amanda Lanham there of BlackRock on the latest in credit, the leadership profile of credit versus, say, equities right now. Coming up, you've heard a lot about this, U.S. exceptionalism. The economy is far more resilient, as you know, than, 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 is, than is appreciated. What's actually driving the, the market is, um, is earnings expectations, which have generally been improving over, over the last few weeks. That was Neil Dutter of Renmac. Do you remember the Europe story, the boom over in the Eurozone? Well, arguably, Europe was in a recession Q4, Q1, and now it's the return of exceptionalism in the United States of America. That conversation, up next. The economy is far more resilient, as you know, than, 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 is, than is appreciated. And that's going to mean that the Fed's ultimately going to have to do more than what's, than what's priced. What's actually driving the, the market is, um, is earnings expectations, which have generally been improving over, over the last few weeks. Earnings are up, and that's why the market's up.
Neil Dasser of Renmax still optimistic. The latest comments adding to these just last week. The main reason for optimism on the U.S. economy is that inflation, especially prices for commodities, is easing more rapidly than the labor market. As a result, real incomes will expand, supporting consumption. So for some at least, the U.S. economic expansion remains on track despite constant calls for a recession. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Eurozone economy is suffering the mildest possible contraction. According to revised data for the 20-nation economy, shrinking 0.1% between January and March, adding to a fourth quarterly decline of the same magnitude and leading to the first six-month contraction since the pandemic. Let's get to the team coverage. Bloomberg's Mike McKee, Guy Johnson. Guy, straight to you. Are the Europeans calling this a recession or doing that US thing of the last 12 months and arguing about it? This isn't a recession. Of course it's not a risk. Who cares, John, whether or not the economy was point up uh, or point down? What does matter is that this was a period of stagnation, let's call it that, in which core inflation, John, either accelerated to the upside or was incredibly sticky. We had a mild recession and inflation didn't come down. Core inflation didn't come down. And that's the way to watch this. Yeah, it, we were down a touch. But it could have been significantly worse. We had the energy crisis that didn't turn up. Uh, we had fiscal policy that was very expansionary. So, yes, the numbers could have been worse. We already know that. What is important about this number is that it coincides with a period of very strong inflation. What kind of a recession, therefore, are we going to need to bring inflation back down to target for the ECB? Mike McKee, is that the smell of stagflation going into next week in the ECB? Yeah. Well, it, it certainly could be. But uh, the question is, in the United States... Uh, how different are we from what's going on in Europe? Well, one thing is the central bank has a dual mandate, not just inflation, which is still double what they anticipate or would like to see in their mandate, but we also have an employment mandate. And we got some news this morning that suggests maybe some cracks in that. Jobless claims rise by 28,000, the biggest increase in some time, to 261,000. Is it a harbinger of what's coming in the labor market? Or is it a one-off like the last time we saw a bit of a spike. That's going to be a question the Fed doesn't have an answer to because the next claims numbers come out on Thursday of next week and the meeting is Wednesday. Uh, we're also expecting to see some new pro uh, projections from the Fed for growth and for unemployment and for inflation. Here's the latest Bloomberg economic survey. Uh, while we do have uh, predictions for slowing growth, economists surveyed by Bloomberg, as you can uh, see there, that white line, think we just won't go under the zero line, unlike the uh, Europeans. But look at the bottom there. They're also predicting a 65% chance of recession. So on the one hand, they're predicting recession. On the other hand, they're saying we're not going to contract. I'm not sure anybody really knows what's going to happen here in the States. Hey Guy, you get the final word on what's going to happen over in Europe. The ECB set to hike next week. What's the what next from the ECB after that? Well, the what next after that, probably, John, is, is another rate hike. Inflation is proving to be incredibly stubborn. To Mike's point, they have a single mandate. To use Jean-Claude Trichet's phrase, there is a single needle in the compass. They need to get inflation back down to target to retain credibility. It is not coming down. The economy is stagnating and it's not coming down. They need to push harder, seems to be the message. You're hearing it consistently across the board from most members of the governing council. So what next is, is another rate hike. The question is, do they then pause... And do we then end up in a scenario where they pause maybe for one, two meetings and then they have to come back, a bit like the Bank of Canada and a bit like the RBA? That is the challenge that I think central yep. banks are dealing with right now and they're watching very carefully what is happening elsewhere. Agreed. That's the conversation of the last 24 hours in a much more pronounced, bigger way. Guy Johnson, Mike McKee, looking forward to the coverage with you guys a little bit later. Guy and Alex Steele coming up in about seven or eight minutes' time. Consensus trades this year. We've been talking about it on this show over the last few months and just getting eaten alive. We came into 2023. We don't like tech. Tech ripped. We don't like the US dollar. The dollar over the last couple of months started to show some strength. We think we're going to get rate cuts, then we have to price them out. We love Europe. We love Europe. Do you still love Europe? Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Well done. We're looking at a tiny loss for the S&P 500 at this point, but much bigger moves beneath the surface, especially to the downside. We have real estate down 1.6%. The financials down uh, three quarters of a percent. Materials, industrials both down more than half a percent. To the upside, consumer discretionary and technology. So after yesterday's big sell-off, we have a little bit of a bounce back for the mega cap techs. Let's take a look at this rotation that we're seeing over the last week, because it is pretty interesting that you have uh, small cap up 6%, helped out by the banks, up by about the same amount. But the Nasdaq 100 and the Sox, well, they are both lower. Abby, thanks for that. Coming up, your trading diary.
pounds whipsawed over the last 24 hours, stuck between surprise rate hikes from the Central Bank of Canada, pushing yields higher by almost eight basis points. About an hour and 25 minutes ago, jobless claims in America surging, pushing yields back down by about seven basis points to the front end. Equities not doing much at all, down about 0.1%. That's the price action. Let's get to the trading diary. 11 a.m., about an hour from now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak sitting down with President Biden at the White House. Salesforce holding its annual general meeting at 2 p.m. Next week, UBS could complete its Credit Suisse takeover as early as Monday. CPI on Tuesday, PPI on Wednesday, then a main event Wednesday afternoon. It's Chairman Powell and a rate decision with that news conference too. From New York, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.